please. Uh, we're talking about uh, random variables and discrete or continuous. Okay. So we said for for continuous uh, variables, please. Oh, it's, it's difficult when you talk when I'm. No. Okay. Uh, so for continuous variables, we need to specify the probabilities in terms of a density function like this. Right. And for discrete, we could just specify directly the probabilities of getting x equal to whatever. Okay, so in a probability distribution, there are two fundamental, what we call, parameters. Um, and that is what we call the mean. Usually use the Greek letter, which is pronounced in English as mu. And also called the expected value of the, of the random variable. And the second one is called by the Greek letter sigma, uh, I usually write SD of x, this is the standard deviation. And these two parameters, they kind of describe the, say, if you have some probability distribution here, then the mu will describe the center point. Whereas the sigma will tell you something about uh, to what extent uh, x values will tend to deviate from this central value. So there are a measure of center and dispersion, as we say. Um, these are closely related to what we talked about last week as descriptive measures, namely having a set of observations of a variable. We talked about the average in the sample. We sometimes also call it the sample mean, or we call that also the mean. So x bar, you remember, x bar, sample mean. Um, so this is what we call an estimate of this true parameter, right? So the typical situation, you have a random variable like the oil price or anything, and you want to talk about the theoretical mean, but you can never get to it. It's not possible to compute, but you can estimate it with, um, with the sample mean. And our intuition will tell us that the more times you sample a random variable, the better you are able to estimate it. And this is precisely one of the tasks of basic statistics, is to say, OK, we say that x bar will approach the mu when you increase the number of observations. But the question is, if I have 50 observations, how close is actually? Yeah, I'm going to address this question later. But how close is x bar to mu? And similarly, we might want to know something about the sigma uh, of x. Okay. Sometimes I have sigmas, and I, if I want to stress that this belongs to the variable x, I might put an x like an index there. This is the standard deviation of x. So it's just notational, means the same. But sometimes we have several variables. We have x and y, then we have sigma x, sigma y, and so on. Um, 
So you remember we also had the sample standard deviation. I won't repeat the formula now, but there was a way of computing a sample standard deviation. And that would be an estimate of this theoretical standard deviation. Hmm? Right. Yeah, so here uh, I repeat what I said. And the same with the mu's. If I have, say, an x and a y, and I want to talk about the mean for x and the mean for y, I just put index like this. Fairly obvious. OK, so this, um, I mean, a probability distribution for a continuous variable, it can, in principle, look in many ways. It could look, for instance, like this. Could be a typical income distribution in a city, for instance. So <coughs> most people are in this lane here, and then there are a few with the deviating incomes. But there is one probability distribution that is more important than any other, and it's a normal distribution. And the probability density for this one is quite mystical. The, f the density function looks like this. Uh, so this is a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. It has this mysterious equation as a probability density. And luckily, maybe we are not going to work on this expression in any fashion. It's just to admire it, almost. So it's quite amazing. It's a kind of a natural law for the normal distribution, combining two fundamental physical or natural constants. So it's pi down here and the base of the natural logarithm here. So there is quite, I mean, it's quite far from obvious that this is the fundamental probability distribution that we need. Yeah. OK, so normal distribution. We're going to write n mu sigma to denote and OK, this is a shorthand meaning is something like this. So in statistics, we say all of the time, x is the number of this, x is the blah, blah, blah. So we have shorthand for that. And we also say x has this distribution, or x is distributed like this all of the time. So I don't want to write that all of the time. So we have this shorthand there. So this says that x has a normal distribution with mean mu standard deviation sigma. So it could be n, 5, and 2. Then the central value is 5, and the standard deviation is 2. No difficulty there. Here are two normal distributions on the slide there. The one here is shown in red. So the center point is the, the top point of the distribution here. And the standard deviation is 2, so it tells me that this is spread out in a particular way. I might note that 5 plus 2 times sigma would be 9. So we're out here. This is mu plus 2 standard deviations. And this is mu minus 2 standard deviations. So you see that mainly everything happens between plus minus 2 standard deviation away from the mean. It's actually 95% of the action is, is there. I'm going to stress this time after time, but it's a very nice intuition to us. All right. And the other one, it has a s different mean, and it has a lower standard deviation, so the distribution is more focused. Right. It has a narrower interval of possible values because the sigma is low. Uh, 
And then there is the, the perfectly, or the, the fun most fundamental normal distribution is what we call the standard normal. And this has mean zero and standard deviation one. So the distribution looks like this. Here is the center, and then uh, plus two standard deviation is out here, and minus two standard deviation down here. And I will show you in a short while, if repeat, uh, probably you all did this sometime in your statistics basic class, find the probability that using a, sta a normal standard normal table. We're going to do it anyway, so we just get warmed up. Um, and this table is, this is a remarkable um, statistics book in the sense that it has one single table. Normally a statistic book has, I mean, at least 50 pages of various tables. Of but we're going to keep it simple. We're going to use only the, the normal table. Um, and it's on, last year it was on page 142. This is not correct anymore. It's now on page uh, 178. Right. We are going to do t tests, but we are going to either approximate the t distribution with the normal, or we're going to use uh, SPSs. Uh, so we're going to take a very pragmatic view on that. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to hope to tell you sometime that statistical tables are maybe are sort of a dying business anyway, because take Excel or SPSs for that matter, but Excel can do all kinds of probability calculations for you. So if you want to know what this is, and you don't happen to have this table, but you have Excel, which almost everyone has, you just plug this in and then it finds it for you. Okay, um, so why do we need only the table for this n01 distribution? Well, this is simply because we can do something called standardization. So if you take any normal distribution, any normal variable x like this, and then I take x and I subtract the mean and I divide by the standard deviation and I get a new variable, I call it z. Then it happens that this animal here will always, always follow a, norm, a standard normal distribution. And clearly you understand that any question like probability x less than a through this transformation here, um, must be expressible as the probability of set less than some other value c. So here is one example, just a visual example. Um, you start with a normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation 20. The picture looks like this. Um, and this probability here is the probability that x is less than 140. But in fact, we see that this is the same as saying, OK, what's the probability that you get mu x is less than the mean plus two standard deviations? And it, that's going to be the same for any goddamn normal distribution you tell me. 
So why don't we just go to the single simplest one and draw the same picture. Now my mean is zero. And here is two standard deviations. And we realize that this probability has to be the same as this one. It's not a mathematical proof, but it. Um, It seems very likely. So the clue that you just need to remember is we subtract, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, we get a new variable, which is always standard normal. Okay. Um, okay, should we do this? I'm just going to ration on my time here. I'm just going to show you how this is done, and then we'll see what happens. So x is n120, meaning the mean is 100, standard deviation is 20. The probability that x less than or equal to 140. Uh, Well, the way I try to do this is just to, OK, if x is less than 140, that's the same as saying that x minus mu divided by sigma is less than or equal to 140 minus mu divided by sigma. So I just subtract the same and divide by a positive number on both sides of an in inequality. And this is the same as saying x less than 140 is equivalent to this. OK? And if you agree to that, then we say that, OK, uh, let me call this set. But set is now a standard normal by my rules of standardization. And this would be just a number. I can insert the values for mu and sigma on the right side. So I get here to write p of x minus mu over sigma. Let's do it in a careful se series of steps. Like this. And then I just recognize this as something that is a standard normal. So I write just set for it. We always use capital set for the standard normal. And then here it would say 140 minus 100 divided by 20 equals probability that set is less than or equal to 2. So it's actually just computing what is shown in this picture that if this is 140, the corresponding cutoff value for the set variable is 2. And how do I find this? Well, I look to page 178. Um, or I'm going to be slightly lazy because I have the table in a separate file here. And so let's say a word about this normal table. It says here what it is. It's, it shows you the probability that set is less than or equal to, oh, 
okay small set for little set equal to zero and then 0 0.01 0 0.02 blah 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 up to something up to actually 3.99 so here is before there is 3.98 so it simply gives me the cumulative probabilities for a standard normal for a pretty dense set of values here from zero up to okay Well, basically four then, 3.99. And certainly the probabilities on the top there, they are just equal to one. So nothing of interest happens beyond that point. Um, okay. So we're going to have, and the way this is uh, constructed is more or less a standard way. You have sort of the set is here so you go for the main part of set is in tenths and then you add hundreds by going along this column so if i want to find 2.0 um it's this value here so i go down till i find 2.0 and then i should add nothing to that so it's going to be this value here which is 0 0.977 with two actually and just to make sure we get it if I want to find the probability that set is less than 1.55 I would look for 1.5 and then add 500 to that which is here so I go this line and that column and I find 0 0.9394 done this before I guess but maybe not exactly with exactly this table but they are more or less all the same um, These things are worked in the compendium, so I'm not going to be very detailed about it. But um, so second one. the probability that x is greater than 70 so before you get very comfortable with this draw the picture so here is 100 um, and the standard deviation was 20 right so if I go 80 and 60 I'm um, more or less out of uh, out of the action and 70 is here so the probability that I'm asking for is this one huh probability x greater than 70 is what is to the right of this one now you can you can do th two things here. You can either try to use the symmetry of the normal distribution here directly and say that, okay, 70 there, that's one and a half sigma from here. So if I go, uh, if I go 120 and 130, this thing is perfectly symmetric around the mean. So this probability to the right there should be the same as what's left of this one. So this should be
that one, and then you do this exactly as this previous thing. Just standardize it from there. Or you could standardize directly from here and get to the probability of x greater than 70 would be equal to probability that set is greater than. And here you would be minus 1.5 standard deviation of the mean. And that would be minus 1.5 here. And and then you would use symmetry again on the standard normal thing. Right. Let's do the, the third there. So maybe we may not get through everything I thought today, which is very common actually. But let's do number three here. Because this is very important. This is a different question, of course. We are now not asking what is the probability of x being greater than something, but we are asking here is my mean and what value can I put up here to say that probability of x less than or equal to b equals, say, 90%? Um, yeah. So I'm going to answer that in the same way as before. I'm going to have to standardize the question, but I'm going to have to determine a constant afterwards. So b is unknown at the moment, but we are trying to find it. I'm going to put up uh, kind of an equation to determine it. So I write, this is my determining equation actually, but I'm going to rewrite it in terms of standards. So I do, okay, this must be exactly the same probability as having x minus mu over sigma less than or equal to b minus mu over sigma. So it's the same old simple trick. Subtract the same thing, divide by the same positive number. Then I get the equi an equivalent e inequality. And then I say again, OK, this is going to be standard normal distribution here whatever, so it's set less than or equal to b minus mu over sigma. And I might like to just, OK, mu and sigma are known. They are 120, but the b here is unknown. right? So uh, mathematically, I can do a little trick, or it's not a trick. I'm just going to call that c. So I say this is equivalent to probability of set less than or equal to C. And if I can determine C, like C is 2 point something, then I can also determine B, because all the other stuff here is known, mu and sigma. So obviously, this is going to work. And the determining condition is this should be 0 0.90. So I'm asking what value will cut off 90% on a standard normal distribution, right? <coughs> so my C lives down here with the no standard normal distribution. And I'm now going to find it. I'm going to see what's, what's this value cutting off 90% down here. So then we need to use the table in reverse. Rather than looking at set values and finding probabilities, we look at the probability and try to determine this guy. Uh, so I will try to find the number here that is closest to 0 
and then I will look what is the corresponding set value. And maybe I need to take the average of some close values. Um, 0 0.90. This is pretty close, huh? So for now, I might go for that one. I could do some averaging between these two. This is a little bit below, and this is a little bit above. So the corresponding set value should be somewhere between these two. But let's stick with that one. Then we get 1, 2, 1.2, and 8. So this equation implies c equals 1.28. And that implies, since c equals b minus mu over sigma, then a little calculation here reveals that b has to be mu plus 1.28 sigma. And then finally, you can introduce mu equals 100 and sigma equals 20. So it's 1 times 1.28 times 20. And you arrive at something. In the example here, somewhere. Uh, is this right? Yeah, probably it's right. It says 125.7. Does it make sense? Well, you can draw this original normal distribution just to check. So here is 120. Ah. Here. Yeah, something like it. So it makes some sense. It's not perfectly to scale, but it makes sense that it's a little bit about 120, which is one standard deviation up from the mean. Okay. Uh, in logistics, this uh, value here is what you would, I mean, if you consider x to be the demand for a commodity, then you would call this a 90% uh, safety inventory or something. Because you're 90% sure that the demand will not exceed what you have in your inventory for a week or so. And it's quite important to determine that kind of safety stocks. And you know, the beauty of mathematics here is that we have solved this problem not only for this particular 100. 20 normal distribution, but for any normal distribution by this beautiful little formula here. So whatever the normal distribution is, if I take mu and add 1.28 of the standard deviations, I will be 90% covered. So that's pretty nice. OK. So 
clearly this to, to work with a normal table is something you should be familiar with and do some exercises and make sure you, you don't have problems with that. If you have problems, you ask some me, for instance, or some other student. Um, yeah, so just let me just briefly state what this means. The normal table provides this kind of probability for all positive. Basically, for set greater than zero, zero you can f determine it directly from the normal table. So that's these kinds of probabilities. And then, if we have something like this, how do you find that one? Well, it's a famous and fundamental law of the complement. So this is a probability. <coughs> then this probability must be equal to 1 minus the opposite event. Hmm? That goes for any probability. So probability of an event is 1 minus the probability of the op opposite. Now, mathematically, this is the opposite. This is not exactly what we have in the table. But remember, set is a continuous. Variable, so this is going to be 1 minus the less than or equal a. So it's a law of complement with a slight tweak here, which allows us to find this one in the table and then answer the original question by taking 1 minus whatever you find in the table. Um, You can draw all this picture and then you just realize how this works. Okay. This one. And then go to just move symmetrically over here and you realize that this probability equals this one and then you take one minus well you're in this situation again basically so you can determine something like that even if b is negative and well with a little creativity you realize that you can do anything relevant here for instance, if this is your interesting probability, obviously this area has to be the area from here and downwards minus the area from here and downwards. So in other words, this would be p of set less than or equal to b minus this okay I still think we are in uh, fields where you have been before mathematically or statistically so I'm just supposing you can do any calculation like this using the table now and just tell me if you don't because then we'll sort it out um, So we have about uh, like five slides left and 60 seconds. So I'm not going to do the mistake to try to finish this lecture. 
because the, f the end here is quite important. But let's say we try to finish this on start on Thursday. And then we do as much of the exercises as we manage on Thursday. Um, so up to then, you can just work on the exercises from chapter one, as long as you understand the question and think you can answer it. You are free, of course, to read the whole chapter one and try the some final exercises are about confidence intervals, so it might be very familiar to you anyway. So then it's 1.15 on Thursday. We finish this and then do some exercises. So the end of this lecture will then not be on video, I guess, because we don't want to rig up all these extra cameras. That's going to be OK.